Well, it's great to see you all this morning. It is mid-February. You couldn't tell by the weather, though, huh? Except this morning we had that surprise snowfall. So whenever you're watching this now and this week, next month, six months from now, uh, they, we had a great little cute snowfall today. And we hope you're nestled in at home nice and warm. And wherever you're at, we consider you a part of this community. I kind of reminded you a couple weeks ago, there, are, there were 370 what we call unique devices that tuned in online in the last few weeks. In other words, we don't know how many of your family are sitting behind that or if it's just you behind that device at home, but we know this. We are imagining that there is a group of you that we consider a community in and of itself, and we're learning how to make sure that we're part of your lives and able to take care of you. And one of the ways we do that is, would you take the time to fill out the Connect card? Um, we take these things really, really seriously. Not in the sense that if you don't fill it out, we're like, who are you? But in the whole idea of you let us know how we can pray for you, please let us know how to stay in touch with you. Or if the fact that you're not necessarily with us in person is something we can help you make that transition toward. That said, we want to make sure that wherever you're at, though, you understand we're cool with the fact that you're joining us this way, and we're actually quite thrilled with it. We had an amazing weekend last week, and I want to talk about it before I talk about what's coming up for the next few weeks. We did our vision weekend once a year at the beginning of the year. We talk about who we think we are as a community and what we think God is saying, and we also link baptism to that weekend. We've believed that for the last few years that the Lord is doing a special kind of blessing over baptism. Now, of course, it's a sacrament of the church. The church has always believed in it. The church has always known that in it is not just a sign of what we are doing in the world by saying, I'm going to follow Christ. But there's, we believe there's a grace in it, meaning it is a, it's an actual act of obedience that when you do it, some form of grace that's given to us as believers, people who have been found in Christ, is released to us. Friends, that's really exciting to us, and we were particularly thrilled last week. 55 people got baptized. 10 of them were spontaneous, and I had the privilege of being a part of that, actually in the tank for many of them. And just the stories of why people are responding. We are seeing the power of God at work. I'm amazed. I was studying this week, and I was reminded in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul, do you know he rarely ever talks about the actual earthly teachings of Jesus? But what he does talk about, almost solely talks about when it comes to Jesus, is the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. Paul believed there was a power in Jesus dying, and that was what baptism is. It's us identifying with that death and the power of the resurrection to come out of that grave and to live a new life. And that's something we be believe in in a big way here at Effort of Community Church. One of the things, if you spend any time around our community, we're gonna remind you that we believe in transformed lives. Now we can't always control the pace of that transformation. We can't always control the nature of that transformation. But we do know this, we're not simply trying to get through this world. We're not simply trying to get to the next world. We believe that God wants to address things in our lives, in our relationships, in our vocations. And that's one of the things we're doing for the next four weeks. We're doing what we call our relationship series. We seriously are aware that most of the challenges that we face in life are related to relationships, lack of attachments that should be there, hurts and traumas that have slipped in. So we're spending four weeks talking about what does it mean to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts when it comes to relationship? And first and foremost, that comes to making sure that we have the mind of Christ. And that's what Kevin's diving into today. We're going to be talking about sometimes the paradigms or the views or the expectations we're carrying toward others, men and women, husbands, wives, bosses, employees, co-workers, etc. And we're going to talk so much out of the book of Ephesians about how God is breaking down the walls between us. So we hope that wherever you're at right now, we know we're diving into a relationship conversation, and that comes with some levels of comfort and discomfort, but we believe the Holy Spirit's going to do some. So make sure even at the end of the day, you give us a chance to pray for you. Even there, when things are winding down and it's easy to get up from your computer or your listening device, take the time to sit and be a part of the time when we're praying over relationships at the end of the day. Now, if you're interested in being part of baptism, what well, next one's gonna be on Easter, and next week, super excited, we're doing our baby dedication. It's gonna be a fun time. There are dozens of babies, man. We are a kind of church that has no problem producing babies. Matter of fact, I joke sometimes, it's like evangelization through procreation. Man, we have so much, so much joy around the children that we have. 
Tune in to be a part of our baby dedication next week. And until then, enjoy these teachings on relationships and may the peace of Christ rule in you. Be well.
verse here is called I Believe. I just really love this song. I just love the way that we can just declare the goodness of God. I believe. I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel broken hole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they roll away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I will something to be said about passing down the stories of what God has done in our lives to the next generations. Passing those stories down to our kids and our grandkids about how great our God is and this is how he has moved in my life, how he's moved in our lives. So I want to sing that bridge again and I want to sing this as a prayer that our ceiling can become their floor when it comes to faith in Jesus faith in what God has done for us. 
just gonna take a moment and spend some time in his presence right now. I'm just gonna keep playing. If there's something God has placed in your heart, he's moving in your heart. Just take a moment. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of fate are never enough.
Yeah. Let's give the Lord a clap. That was great. Yeah, Lord. Woo. Okay, at this time, we're going to release our children to their classes. And as they go, I just want to say a prayer over them. Father God, we thank you for these children, for the blessing that each one of them is in our lives. Lord, just keep them safe, mentally and physically and emotionally, Lord. Protect them from all of the things going on in this world. Father, as they go back to their classes, just give them an understanding of who you are and what it means to be a child of God. In your name I pray. Amen. Are you past the point where is your birth? Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. Listen to the word of the Lord, Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, 
but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. <laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ah, oh, the name of Jesus. Paul writes that the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to the name of Jesus. Father, we just want to take this moment and pause in prayer. Thanking you for the mighty name of Jesus our Savior, our friend, our Redeemer. God, I thank you for the opportunity to declare your name here today. And God, today, I pray that the name of Jesus would be just a banner over every person watching online, every person in this room, that the name of Jesus would be a banner over their lives. So that, God, that you would continue to lead us in your love to those around us. As we sang a few moments ago. And God, I thank you for being obedient, Lord Jesus, and giving your life for us. And God, I thank you, God, that you've, let, that you've put Jesus and you lifted him to the highest place. And we just want to exalt the name of Jesus today. And God, I pray that whatever we're carrying here today, maybe even some labels that people have, God, the name of Jesus is above every other name. It's above every label. And we tear down every stronghold today in the name of Jesus. And we cancel the assignments of the enemy upon personal lives, upon the congregation, upon this region, upon our state, upon our nation, and upon this world. We cancel the devil's assignments and we ask for the love and grace of Jesus Christ to be poured out afresh and anew today. Lord, let it be a new era. And God, may our lives reflect the love and the grace of Jesus. God, I thank you that there's freedom <laughs> only through you and in you. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. And I just declare freedom in this house today. Freedom to know you, freedom to follow you, freedom to walk in your purposes and plans. Holy Spirit, would you just quicken our thoughts today and our hearts Help us to see what you want us to see. Help us to know what you want us to know. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. And then, Lord, I ask you, would you quicken our feet that we would go where you want us to go? Lord, we love you, and we're so grateful to be your sons and daughters, and we just honor you with our lives in the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus. And all God's people said... Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Hey, you may be seated and say hello to someone around you. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning into the presence of the Lord. Great to see all of you in the room, your smiling faces. Welcome to those of you watching online today. My name is Wes. I serve as one of the pastors here at Ephraim Community Church. And uh, on behalf of the team here, we just welcome you home. We welcome you uh, to experiencing and encountering and worshiping the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name. And we're so excited for all God has. You know, these next 24 hours are fairly significant and maybe not for the reason that you think uh, that it's not significant because of what's happening in the Winter Olympics. as not necessarily significant because of a, a Super Bowl that will be played later today. 
what's significant is tomorrow's Valentine's Day. All right? Reminder to you guys and gals, right? Um, but I'm also reminded of, uh, of something we were singing about, about the love of God, right? And Valentine's also reminds me of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Wow. That he gave his son Jesus so that you and I could experience life. And that is good news, friends. And that's our vision here at Africa Community Church, connecting you with God and others, and the love of God uh, as well. And so it's so good to have you here today. And again, just a reminder, we'd love hearing from you. Take a moment to fill out that Connect card either online or in that seat back pocket. And if you do not get our weekly e-news, take out that Connect card, put your name and email address on there, and we will send it to you. Down in the prayer request section, you can just send, please send me e-news, and we'll get you signed up. There's so much good information uh, about what's happening in the life what the Spirit is doing among us here at ECC, and we want you to stay connected, and we invite you uh, to stay connected in that particular uh, way. Hey, next weekend is baby dedication, and this weekend is the last weekend to sign up for that, so parents, if that kind of went under your radar, I think we have 25 signed up as of this morning, 25 babies to dedicate next weekend, so there's probably some more, and if you're watching online or you're here in the room, and you, hey, sign up if you have a, a baby in the last number of months, you'd love to dedicate to the Lord. We'd love to pray over our children, and we're looking forward to that um, next weekend. Well, today, I'm getting ready for a pun, so are you ready? So today, we are going to kick off a new series. Oh, boy, that's lame, right? All right, sorry. Uh, a new series on let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's out of Colossians chapter 3. Pastor Kevin has the first message in this series. I'm looking forward. It's a great word, a great challenge to us today. So get ready, get your pen, paper, your message notes ready for that. Uh, Kevin will come and share that here in a moment. But before he does, a couple video announcements and a wonderful financial testimony that you want to pay attention to as well. Hey, Ephrata Community Church, it is great to be with you today. Here at ECC, it is our desire to connect you with God and others, and here are a few simple ways we can do that. If this is your first time visiting with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here. In the seat back pocket in front of you, you'll find a Connect card. Let us know that you're joining us today and how we can be praying for you this week. You can take that Connect card to our Welcome Center where you can receive a gift. We hope you enjoy your time at ECC. Connect cards aren't just for first time guests. We wanna hear from everyone. We encourage you to fill one out in person or online each time you're with us so we can better pray for you, celebrate with you, and provide care and connection. You can drop the Connect card in one of the giving kiosks as you leave the auditorium. We provide multiple opportunities for you to give. Envelopes are available in the seat back pocket in front of you and can be dropped in any of the designated boxes as you exit the auditorium. You can also give online through the ECC app or by texting your amount to 84321. Want to stay informed on the happenings and events at Ephrata Community Church? Sign up to receive our weekly e-news. With so many exciting things happening throughout the year, we want you to be informed about all of them. Simply let us know on the Connect card that you want to receive our e-news, which is sent every Thursday. Since uh, January of this year, I've moved from working in Baltimore for the last 12 years. Part of driving backwards and forwards to Baltimore for so many years, it wears cars out. And uh, we were at the end of the usefulness of our car. And we just didn't really have enough money to get a nice car, but enough to get a car. And I was driving home from work one night in Philadelphia. And while we, I was sort of arguing how, what we were gonna do, what we could afford, um, the Lord had an idea and it came upon us, upon me rather surprisingly, in the shape of a probably four or five hundred pound deer. So fortunately I was doing um, a decent enough speed for it to just glance right off, although I don't think I've ever seen a deer fly that high, but it was fairly spectacular and in the process of that happening I was trying to figure out, hold on a second, in my arguing in my head, how am I going to afford a car? My car gets destroyed. Now I don't have a car, but what's going to happen? It turns out that the car is worth a lot more than it was when I bought it. 
uh, insurance paid off and all of a sudden we've got a decent nest egg of money to buy a brand new car. <laughs> we really took to heart the challenge about the tithing. Um, we didn't officially enter the 90 day challenge but unofficially did. I suppose we didn't notify anyone. Unbeknownst to me, Kimberly had already been really um, praying a lot about being obedient to the just the organization of it and uh, set up a automatic deposit. Just the discipline of setting it up seemed to change the structure of some things in our in our home. I, I can't really put my finger on how, but it was like something did really change. We just had seemed to have money coming in <laughs> week after week that we hadn't planned on. It was really weird. Um, but I hadn't known that Kimberly had made this decision to start making, um, you know, automatic deposits. And I, I'm like, what's going on here? We've, we've never had this much money in our bank in years. Um, what, what did you do? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, hey, he, he provides. He provided for me and our family. Despite what you need, um, your greatest desire has to be for the intimacy with Christ to be held by him, to just want to walk with him, just to want to see him. Um, if that's your greatest desire, um, everything else just, it, it, not that it doesn't matter, but it all falls into place. Um, there's a scripture in Colossians that says all these disjointed things, they find their perfect order under Christ. Let go of your passions for other things and your desires to make other things work. He, he puts it all in place and it's not because of any effort, uh, it's just because of love and your sacrifice to him. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing that. I thought, okay, we can just go home now because he's already preached the message, right? I mean, what he said is, uh, Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be taken care of. And we worry about all these things and we pursue all those things and then we never seem to get there. But then when you put that in proper order, man, everything just comes together. You're like, I don't know how that happened, but everything just kind of worked the way it's supposed to work, right? Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, hey, there's been... Uh, a fever going around, and I want you to be aware, you know, we're living in a time of Delta variant and Omicron and all kinds of other stuff, and so spring fever, uh, the 2022 version has been going around. There is no known vaccine for it. There's no protection from it, except for a good snowstorm seems to kind of squash it a little bit, but it's been going around, and so uh, I hope that you've been subject to it to some degree and it gets a little bit warmer and days are getting a little bit longer and uh, there is a cure, it's called springtime. And it is coming, it's a coming, I love the snowfall today. It's like, I think nobody can complain about today's snowfall. Melts on the pavement, everything else makes it look nice. No complaints, all right? I still think we're looking for, you know, 12 to 24 to 36 and, I mean, every now and then you just gotta have one. So, man, a rowdy crowd today. Hey, we had a great time in baptism last weekend. Uh, the end result of that was 55 people got baptized last weekend. And uh, it's really great to be a part of that. As you know, for those of you that sign up and become a part of baptism, we ask you to write out your testimony. And the reason we do that is... Uh, of course, other people want to hear your testimony. But one of the reasons we do that is actually to help you, for you to think through, okay, why am I doing this and what's happening and what is God doing in my life? And it enables you to articulate because we give you a word limit. It enables you to actually think through and articulate what God is doing in you. And then for me, as actually being a part of baptism in that way, you know, as someone is in the tank, they're actually hearing their own words read back to them and it impacts them. It impacts them simply because they're hearing it from a different perspective. And man, there's just simply a grace that surrounds that event. And uh, one of the things from last week was I just simply noticed that there were many people that took that very significant step and literally their countenance was different when they came out as they were going in. They took that step in faith, recognizing the significance of what baptism is. And God just did amazing things through that. 
A couple stories from last weekend. Uh, there were a lot of stories, but there was a young man, uh, nine, year old, nine years old, that on Saturday night uh, went home from church, uh, went to and, and talking with his mom, ended up giving his life to the Lord last Saturday night after the church was over, church, church service was over at home. But then this nine-year-old says, and we're going back tomorrow because I want to be baptized. And <laughs> members of the family... I mean, this boy's immediate family were there, was, was home, but a couple members of the family, significant members of the family were away for the weekend. Hey, would you want to wait for another time when, you know, they can be here? Nope, we got to be baptized. Like, we're doing this now. So he came back on uh, Sunday afternoon, and they were baptized. And then there were at least two people that were watching online Sunday morning and said, we're getting dressed, and we're going there, and we're getting baptized on Sunday afternoon. It was just amazing to be a part of that. And, uh, and the... One of the great things about that is it's just simply God at work in our midst. You know, I don't need to twist arms. I'm not manipulating. I'm just, like, I'm just trying to declare the truth. Uh, God, God's spirit is at work. He's motivating that. I mean, it's the work of the Lord. It's the foundation for everything that we see happening around here. And then it's for you, actually, to, to yield to him. And I know you get caught in those positions where you think, do I take this step or not take this step, whether it's baptism or getting involved in a group of some way. But just simply surrendering to him and yielding to him and letting him do his work just does amazing things uh, in and through us. And I'm really very grateful. My, I do have a goal in mind of all of that, and that is just simply to be normal. I want us to be a normal church. And normal is not defined by what is normal in America or what is normal in church structure. And, but I find that normal is actually defined by the book of Acts. And what is normal in the book of Acts, I mean, that's when Christ birthed the church. God birthed the church through the work of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1 and 2. And what is normal as defined by the book of Acts is regularly people are getting saved. They're yielding as their life to the Lord. They're being baptized. God is using, God is working through us to use every single tool available which is signs and wonders and miracles and prophetic and words of knowledge. And all those things are tools by which signs and wonders, signs simply point to some place. And it's, in our case, it's pointing to Jesus. So signs and wonders are not a goal. It's just simply a tool that can be used to point people to Jesus. And that's all normal, even to confront the powers of darkness and see them overcome in the power of the Holy Spirit. All that stuff is considered normal in the body of Christ, in the church, and I just simply want to be normal. And so we're continuing to take steps towards what is normal and what God has for us, and I thank you that we're on that journey together. Right. And not only is, it, is that for us personally, for us as a church, as a congregation of effort, a community church, but I feel our community needs that now more than ever. And I say community in a broad sense. You know, I know our congregation goes from, comes from Lancaster, Berks, and Lebanon County, and and you can think of all the little communities that you're a part of and you're there as well. But one of the things that I notice about the communities around us is over the course of the past couple of years, it's amazing to think that uh, in March of 2022, um, we're entering the third year of what, what we've been kind of living through uh, with COVID-19. But what that has done for all the challenges that it's presented is everything that can be shaken has been shaken. And people trust in the economy, and it's been shaken. People trust in government, and that trust has been shaken. Trust, people trust in the medical community, and that trust has been shaken. And those are all actually very good things, but perhaps there was too much faith put in those places that shouldn't have been there. And if you read Hebrews chapter 12, I won't quote that or read that right now, but if you go to Hebrews chapter 12 and read that, he talks about a time when everything will be shaken, but the reason for that is that he can give an unshakable kingdom. So that when everything is shaken, what, that which cannot be shaken actually stands firm and stands strong. And we know that to be the person of Jesus Christ. Like we know that he is the rock on which we build our lives. And no matter what happens around us, no matter what happens in the world around us, that will not, he will not be shaken. And we will not be shaken as we are in him. And so we're living in a time and a season where as we look at the communities around us and we look at the folks that are around us, the people that we pass by, um, so much has been shaken that they're looking for an unshakable kingdom. And we, you and I, know what that is. And we are coming into a place where I feel like we have to be careful about not keeping the good news to ourselves, but freely sharing and freely using every tool because we live in communities that are hungry 
for the Lord. They may not, may not know, they may or may not know that they're hungry for him, but they are. And I want to pray that way right now. I'm going to invite you to stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your work among us as Effort Community Church. And it's amazing to see work that no person could manufacture, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are doing wonderful things. And we know, God, that these things that you're doing are not only for us, but it's for all those that you love, for the people that are outside of this building, for the people that are outside, not more importantly than outside of this building, it's actually outside of you. And so I pray, Father, for us as a congregation that we would be alert to the season that we are in. We ask you, Father, for revival and awakening in our communities as the world has seen everything that can be shaken, that, we would, that what, would, what would stand firm and what would be obvious is that which cannot be shaken, which is you, Jesus Christ, the kingdom that comes from you, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, we just join our faith together and we recognize that even over the course of our nation, as we look back through history, there's been critical times in which you have, by your sovereign grace and your compassionate, your, 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 your merciful heart, that you have sent an awakening to our nation, you've sent an awakening to our communities, and we would just simply reflect the words of Habakkuk, the Old Testament prophet, where it's recorded that he says, God, we have heard of your fame, we stand at all of your deeds, in this day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, he even says, remember mercy, like we know what we deserve, and we don't ask you based upon what we deserve. We ask you, Father, for your grace and mercy to be poured out upon our land based upon your, the fact that you're compassionate, you're merciful, you're slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and merciful. And I, and, and I ask you, God, we appeal to you, Father, for the sake of our communities, for the sake of our cities, for the sake of our counties, our state, and our nation, and even beyond, that you would bring an awakening to our land, God, in Jesus' name. That there would be a, a, cultural, a cultural awareness of the presence of the Lord. Lord, I've heard the stories. I've heard the stories of times past in this nation and in other nations. And God, my desire is to experience that, to see that in this place, in this land, right here and right now. And God, our, I ask you because you are kind and compassionate and I believe that you're looking for a people who will just simply ask and believe and see what you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thanks for joining with me in that. You can go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to go to right to Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading verses 12 to 17. And I'm reading these uh, handful of verses uh, this is a foundation. Actually, there's just a handful of words in the handful of verses that are actually the foundation for everything that you're going to be hearing over the course of the next four weeks. Let me begin reading here in verse 12. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. And above of all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts towards God. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Sometimes when you think about the Apostle Paul and him writing, the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote this letter to the church at Colossae. And as you think about him writing, you might be thinking like he's got some sort of holy moment going on. He's sitting down at a writing table and he's very comfortable and he's got the scroll laid out, the parchment or whatever he was writing on. He's got the ink well there, or whatever he wrote with. And he's just like crafting these words. But the reality is, is that Paul was in prison. And I've never been to prison. Well, I've been to prison to visit. I just never took up residency in a prison at this point. I mean, who knows? But uh, that's, that's not been a part of my past. And so even the prisons that I've been in and I've visited um, in modern day, uh, they're not nice places. Like, you don't want to live there. So please take my advice and don't take residence up in a prison. Uh, but, you know, to get in there and then come out, uh, it's quite an experience. 
But even that would be the Taj Mahal based upon 2,000 years ago when Paul was in prison. And we don't even know what that was like. Was he malnourished? Was he sick because of maybe some dampness that was there? Had he been beat up by other prisoners? Had he been beat up by guards? And we know from other stories about other times that he was in prison, that's exactly what did happen. But even in the midst of that and all the possibility of him feeling sorry for himself, he knew that he had this concern for this church at Colossae. And it was a church plant that he had been a part of. And unlike a church plant in our day where we can call and visit and, and you know, have that kind of interaction and have all kinds of resources about how to build a church and how to plant a church. And, and they even had, like today, we, of course, we have the word of God. When he's talking about the church of Colossae, they had none of that. They didn't have experience. They didn't have training they were all new converts, and they were planning this church, and they didn't even have the scriptures as we know them today. They probably had Old Testament scrolls to some degree, you know, possibly some could read, some could write, and, but it wasn't all the information that we have today and all the revelation that we have today. So the Apostle Paul was carrying this burden for this church at Colossae, and in the midst of the hardship that he is in personally, he scribes this letter and this letter carries a pattern. The Apostle Paul wrote many of the new, what we call the New Testament books. They're letters to specific churches. And he follows a certain pattern that he also follows in the, church, in the letter to the church of Colossae. And he begins by introducing himself. I'm Paul. This is my role. This is why I'm writing to you. He oftentimes will give thanks. And in the case of Colossae, he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm really grateful for what I'm hearing about you. I'm here that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing and you're doing well. Continue to pursue that. And he gives them some instructions. And oftentimes what Paul will do, actually in the majority of his letters, he actually then does a deep dive into some significant theology. And so I believe that's part of like your behavior follows what you believe. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some right framework to believe. And so in the case of Colossae, he, he has what we call in our modern day a Christology. He has this fantastic hymn with these poetic words about who Jesus Christ is. He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn among all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth and under the earth. And he just goes on about this, the wonder of who Jesus Christ is and what he wants them to believe about who he is. And then he goes to this place. So we go from this conversation or this declaration of who Jesus Christ is, and then he turns it to us. And it's not a pleasant picture. And he says, and you were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. You, that's us. Like he's, he's just, okay, I'm declaring you who Jesus Christ is, and now I'm declaring to you who you are. But then he says, you, for whom that was the case. He has now reconciled by his body of flesh, by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. As you continue in your faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation, and of which I, says Paul, have become a servant. Then he goes to himself and he says, I'm, I'm willing to suffer no matter what it takes in order for you, in order that I can present you before the Lord. And he uses this word perfect. And please, that's not perfection. It's actually a word that means mature. I want, I want you to grow up in him. And so he, he talks about how to grow up. And and then he comes to this place where um, hearing what I read here in Colossians chapter 3, beginning of verse 12, as Paul oftentimes does, he, 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 he digs into this theology like, this is what you need to believe, and then based upon what you believe, now this is how you behave. And so as you read the books like Philippians and Ephesians, you'll notice that pattern. Hey, there's, here's some deep theology, here's some things that you need to know about God and his ways, and then here's how you behave. And here's the reason why I point that out. Religion is completely the opposite of that. Religion says this is how you behave, and maybe you'll find a right relationship with your heavenly father. And so in religion, whether it's even in the Christian religion in certain sects or whether that's uh, in other religions, other world religions, the focus is on behavior. And so it's interesting to notice the pattern of Paul that does not focus on behavior first. It's focused on the heart. It's focused on revelation. It's fo focused on not only what you need to know, but who you need to know and what you need to believe. And then your behavior actually comes out of that. And so behavior actually takes a back seat 
to what you need to know and who you need to know. And so he introduces you, in this case in Colossians, to the wonders of the Savior of Jesus Christ, that he is the preeminent, he's the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might have preeminent. And just believe and know and have revelation of who he is and then let your behavior follow that. And so then he comes to this place here in Colossians chapter 12, 12. 3, verse 12. Are you paying attention? Are you correcting me as I'm going along here? I throw that in on purpose just to make sure you're still awake. Actually, no, I don't. That was actually a mistake. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. He throws that in. He says, okay, so here's your relationship with your heavenly father. Here's your relationship that you can have with the God who created you through Jesus Christ. And then that becomes the basis for all our relationships. So he makes a shift from talking about their relationship with their heavenly father and said, okay, now this is how you live together. And he says, okay, um, you are God's chosen people, holy and beloved. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, forgive one another. Like all of this is the way that we live together in one accord. But all of that is based upon not just simply saying, hey, just be nice to each other. It's actually the way God treats us and that we live that out among us. And you can go to your message notes where it simply says, Jesus Christ is the source for everything that you need, for everything that you need to live in right relationship with your heavenly Father and with others. And actually, I would go as far as to say you can't live in right relationship with other people without living in right relationship with your heavenly Father. And I would go even beyond that to say, like, if you aren't living in right relationship with your heavenly Father, you probably aren't living in right relationship with people around you either. He's the source of everything that we need. One of the things that we've been doing here at ECC over the course of the past, I don't know, seven, eight years maybe, is that we take this season of the year, uh, as we head into February, and people think about Valentine's Day, we, we think about human relationships, and not just marriage. I mean, we deal with marriage at times, and we've taken on various topics, but we've actually made it a good bit broader than that, and we've taken on things like race relationships and between men and women, and so because... We believe that the way that we can, as we are reunited with our Heavenly Father, we can live that out in relationship with others. And we believe the church actually has answers for the world around us. Because we can live in relationship that nobody else can have outside of Jesus Christ. And so we have something to demonstrate before the world. So I remember way back when we started this, this kind of pattern, I was looking for some uh, resources. And I found that there's a study that's done every single year that measures the level of hostility in our culture. And they call it, it's an incivility, which I'm not sure it's kind of a strange word, but it measures like the increase does polls and so forth. And like, do you think things are becoming increasingly hostile? And I've been watching this, this survey that they do every single year. I've been watching that now for maybe six or seven years. And so this past week, I looked over, looked for some resources and found some things online. And I was reading this article and it pretty much said like they're seeing the trend of hostility in our culture just spiking. And they said that it was reaching critical like a critical point of just the hostility in our culture. And then I looked at the date in which the article was written, and it was 2016. Now, do you think from 2016 to 22 that uh, it's actually increased or it's actually gotten better? Like we have, we're more uh, civil towards one another, or do you think that hostility has increased? Can I think a poll right now? I mean, I think people think it increased. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're, I don't think we need a university to spend a million dollars for us to be able to figure that out, do we? And so we've taken on some of that. And what we need to realize is that even though we're, we're believers, we follow Jesus Christ, and we're living, but we, we live kind of in the soup of culture. In other words, so while God influences us, we're also influenced by the hostility around us. And we have to actively operate in a different spirit in order to overcome that. So we need to be aware of what's influencing us from around us and actually live differently in that way. And so we're going to take a number of things on uh, here uh, during these next number of weeks. Jesus Christ is the source of everything that you need to live in right relationship with your heavenly Father as well as in relationship with people around you as well. Plus, the very nature and character of God is the standard that we live by and demonstrate to the world around us. He, like he's the base. In other words, you've got an opinion, so do I. Every opinion takes a back seat to the standard that is the very nature and character of God. In other words, we have these things that, that weigh in on us or speak into us. In other words, 
we might think of the topic of immigration, and we think, okay, I have a political viewpoint, I've got a social viewpoint, there might be an eco economical viewpoint that's all part of that, and all of those are probably actually legitimate, but the one that needs the lead is God's opinion, the nature and character of God, and what he says about treating immigrants, and, and we can think about race relationships, and we think, okay, well, there's a certain group that's gone too far, and that's probably true, and there's a group, certain group that's gone not far enough, and that's probably true, and all of that comes in the mix, and all of that feeds into us, and we have to be careful that those things don't lead us, but it's actually the opinion of God that leads us that all people, regardless of their background, need to be honored. Like they're created in the image of God, all of us are. And so it's his opinion that actually leads us. And we've got to be careful about the politics that influences us or the social or impact upon us. And we have to be able to kind of clear the air and say, but I'm following the Lord. And his nature and character is the standard that we actually live by and actually demonstrate to the world around us. And we've got to be careful about that. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 is a verse I love to quote because it has a twist in it. It says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And there's a bit of a twist because logically you would think if we walk in the light as, we, as he is in the light, God, that we would have fellowship with him. But then it says, it kind of puts a bit of a twist and says, no, as you walk in, in the light with him, you actually get along with people around you. And there's a little bit of a twist there. So our relationship with our Heavenly Father is actually lived out in relationship with one another. So we're taking on a little bit of a topic today that can, can cause a little bit of tension, and that's the relationship between men and women. And I read this story this past week where uh, a man thought his wife talked too much. And so he comes across this article and says that average woman uses 30,000 words per day while the average man uses 15,000 words per day. So he takes this article to his wife and said, see, I told you you talk too much. It says here the average woman uses 30,000, the average man uses 15,000. And she says, that's because I always need to repeat myself to you. <laughs> and he said, huh? <laughs> Husband and wife are driving in the car, having a little bit of a you know, argument from earlier in the day, so it was silent in the car, and they were driving along, and they go past this barnyard, and there's donkeys and goats and sheep in there, and the man says, relatives of yours? And she says, yep, in-laws. So those aren't quite dad jokes, but... So we're actually not dealing with that after setting you up for conversations later on today. We're actually not dealing specifically with marriage relationships, but we are dealing with uh, relationships between men and women. And there's a biblical principle that comes that actually uh, is part of Bible study that when you, when you want to go to a certain topic, you go back to the place of what's called first mention. Jesus did that actually in Matthew 19 when he was uh, questioned about marriage. And you know, this is the way we handle it, or what do we do about this? And he goes all the way back to the very first place where it was not so from the beginning. This is what God's intention is for marriage. So we're going to go right back to um, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. I'm going to read 26, 27, and 28. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. God says this, Then God said, Let us make man, and I don't know what translation of the Bible you're using there, but the Hebrew word behind that word man is the word Adam, and it can be translated in three different ways. It can be the proper name, Adam, it can be the word man, or it can be the word mankind. And so there's a, there's a judgment call of what it means here. But he says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, let them have dominion. So I'm noticing that, um, that while there's different ways of translating the word man, he also then refers to them in the plural, which then would make me think that that word Adam in the Hebrew should possibly be translated mankind. And so I'm just going to read it that way. Let us make mankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. I like that God just threw in the creepy things. Because with some people, I want dominion over those creepy things that come into my house, right? So God created him in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. 
So again, you have this, like this play of both men and women, and he created him, and in the image of God, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So in your message notes, I want to bring a couple things uh, from that passage. Both of all, first of all, both men and women carry the image of God. Both men and women actually are created in the image of God. Secondly, in this case, uh, as we can read there, both men and women were given dominion. Like they were given both, it wasn't just the man that was given dominion, it was both of them were given dominion over the fish, over the creepy things, over the earth. And then thirdly, <clears throat> God actually blessed both men and women. So a couple of things I want to think about and even possibly come to a conclusion based upon that reality is that if God actually did create both men and women in his image, then in order for the church of Jesus Christ to actually know God in the fullness of who he is, we need both men being all that they can be and expressing full biblical masculinity, but then we also need women being all that they can be and actually expressing full a femininity as well. Like we need both men and women doing what God has asked them to do in order for the church to be able to see a more complete picture. So if a church is primarily masculine, then we have a deficient image of who God is you know, actually among us because we're only seeing part of the picture. But in the same way, if, if a church is primarily feminine, then we're also seeing an incomplete picture of who God is. And so for the church to be all that it needs to be, and for the church to actually demonstrate a true image of who God is, a more complete image of who God is, we need both men living out their calling, and we need women living out their calling as well. Secondly, I would also say that for an order, if... if both men and women were given dominion, like it was actually given to both of them, then we need to have both men and women exercising their authority, their God-given rights, their God-given authority, that uh, in order for the kingdom of God to advance. It's not up to men to advance the kingdom. It's not up to women to advance the kingdom. It's up to men and women working together in partnership to see the kingdom advance. And we're going to be walking with a limp if either one of those is deficient. If men take a passive approach and just kind of step back, then we're not going to be able to for, for, uh, take the kingdom forward because we're missing the men in the picture. In the same way, if the women actually step back, we're missing part of that as well. And then thirdly... If God bless both men and women, male and female, then we need to do the same and reflect his honor and glory and reflecting them as well. So some people would say, well, what about uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, where uh, that's after the fall of mankind and God meets them in the garden and he speaks some things to the serpent and to the man and he comes to the woman and he speaks several things to her and he simply says, and your husband's going to rule over you. And so many people would point to that and see that's, that's the world in which we live in, that it's up, actually the husbands actually rule over their wives. Well, friends, since when do we allow the curse to actually define who we are? And didn't Jesus actually come to break the power of the curse? And actually, I would simply go and say, please, please know the heart of God and he, as he communicates that. Like he wasn't the one, God wasn't there to punish. Like he had given them dominion. He gave them the earth. And so pretty much what God was saying is because you've gone astray in this, this is going to be the result of you going astray. So it wasn't like God was intending for that to happen or made it happen. It was a ramification of their own action. It was a ramification of their own action. So we don't live according to the curse. And Jesus Christ, again, gives us the opportunity of living in right relationship with our Heavenly Father and living out a right relationship with the people around us as well. And one of the things that you'll notice, <clears throat> even if you would want to study history, that when God is devoid in a culture, the status of women actually decreases. And women are abused. Uh, women are taken advantage of. And women are lorded over. Uh, over. But every time <clears throat> a true revelation of God steps into a culture or into a people, one of the things that happens is the image of women and the status of women actually increases. 
And I don't have time to do this today, but just simply you can look through the Old Testament. And I know that we look at the Old Testament law that was written so long ago, it's hard for us to comprehend. And, and we look at some of the things that are said there and we think, how can that possibly be? But if we understand that God was stepping into a culture that was way down here and people were treated a certain way, he says, okay, I'm asking you to treat people this way, including women, especially women. Now, we look at this from our perspective, we think, wow, that's pretty bad. But you have to understand that he was, it was a work in process, and he was bringing people along, and he was upgrading the status of women. And we could talk a lot about that, and we don't have time to do that, but I want to talk a little bit about the New Testament, which is the, which is the culture that Jesus stepped into. So there were three primary influences in the New Testament culture, and one of those influences was Greek. Alexander the Great, uh, prior to the time of Romans, uh, the Romans, he had, of course, conquered much of the known world, and part of that was the nation of Israel. That's why uh, the scriptures were originally, the New Testament scriptures, even originally written in the, in the language of the Greek, because that's what was the dominant culture. Well, in the Greek culture, um, women were, were considered, they were supposed to be lorded over, like you needed as a man, keep your, one, your woman under control. I mean, even to the point in their culture of actually lock and key kind of thing, like Keep her locked up. Women were denied education because they actually believed that women were the source of all evil. And so there wasn't no authority, nothing, no opportunity given, and they needed to be constrained. Then, of course, the Romans came, and the Romans were there. And in the Roman culture, women were considered to be fundamentally property. And, and they were literally the property of their husband. And Rome, certain Roman laws actually had it in a way that a woman could gain her freedom. Like she had to work for her freedom. She could work to be free from her husband. And she could do so by having enough children, specifically sons, to supply the Roman army. And if she had enough boys, she could actually be free from the oppression of her husband. Isn't that pretty sick? Now, you would think as well that the Jewish culture would be a little bit different, and it probably was a little bit different, but it wasn't much different. And there was still a lot of, of that kind of lording over. And so Jewish men were taught to pray a prayer, and they would get up in the morning, and they would sometimes walk outside and make this declaration, and they would say, thank you, Lord, that I was not born a Gentile. Thank you, Lord, that I was not born a slave. And thank you, Lord, that I was not born a woman. And it was a daily pronouncement. And I'm convinced that's one of the reasons why, you, as you read the Apostle Paul, you'll hear him say something like this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. In Christ, there is no Greek or Jew. There is no slave or free or male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. And I feel, as I read that in several different books that Paul wrote, that it was actually a, a renouncement of this declaration that he had made, he had been taught to make every day of his life when he came to realize that we are all one together in Christ Jesus. So what did Jesus do? I have that in the notes, don't I? WW, no, not WWJD. WW was, it, was the wrist thing that was like from 20 years ago, what would Jesus do when people had the bands on the wrist? So this is W-D-J-D. I had to focus to make sure I could say that correctly. What did Jesus do? So this is the culture that Jesus stepped into. So how did he act? Like, what did he do? He's a representation. So a couple of things I'm just going to go through real quickly. Number one, he had friends that were women. He had relationships. He had proper, holy relationships with women, um, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, I mean, Lazarus is a man, of course, but that family, like they have relationship together. He didn't avoid them because they were women. Secondly, I noticed that uh, he actually had women disciples. And again, you see the references there in your message notes. You can look up later on. So the Jews had a um, saying, and they would say, it's better to burn the Torah than to teach it to a woman. So you had Jesus actually had women who were disciples. Like the, he, was, he was specifically, as a rabbi, teaching women the ways of God. He would acknowledge women. John chapter 4, he's going through Samaria. This woman had multiple strikes against her. He was, she was a woman. She was a Samaritan. That Jesus saw her and actually drew her into a relationship there. And even as you read that account in John chapter 4, you see the disciples coming back and saying, what's he doing talking to a woman? Like they even asked that question specifically. He acknowledged women. He defended women. And we can think about the, the time where the woman was caught in adultery. And last time I checked, adultery actually takes two. 
But yet only the woman was brought out. It was actually a complete setup, in my opinion, where they were testing Jesus and they set this woman up uh, in this whole scenario. That's just kind of my opinion about all of that. And yet Jesus defended her against her accusers, even though she had committed the sin. He defended her against uh, her accusers. And then last thing that I'll mention, which I think is the most significant in all of this, is that God in his sovereignty chose women to be the first announcers that Jesus is not dead. In first century Rome, women weren't considered credible witnesses. In other words, if you caught stealing something and the witness that saw you do it was a woman, it wouldn't stand up in court. And there's a real clear statement that God in his sovereignty, while the disciples were hiding, it was the women. Just think of, just think of the significance of the world-changing message. Jesus is alive. I've seen him. The tomb is empty. And that message, to witness, to be the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, was given to women. I say all that today to come to this point. I have a very specific challenge both for men and for women. And all of this comes out of, like the challenge comes out specifically of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Which just simply says this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, it's not a sword, it's not a gun, it's not a, you know, bomb or anything, cannon. Like the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. And we take these thoughts that are lies, that things that we believe, things about we, that we believe about God that are not true, things that we believe about ourselves that are not true, things that we believe about others that are not true. Like we take these lies and we throw them down and we make them submit to the knowledge of the Lord. Like we make them submit to what we know the truth is through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you to do that specifically today. Men, I'm just asking you to search your heart and say, is there anything in me that thinks that women are less than? And while I'm going to be gracious in the midst of all of that and say to you that I realize that we live in a culture that has been male-dominated and that's been the case, um, and so we kind of grow up in that soup and so we learn to kind of think of certain things, I'm asking, like, we've got to tear down strongholds that are not, that set themselves up against the knowledge of God, like inconsistent with the nature and character of God. And if we are carrying a mindset deep inside that actually say that, says that women are less than, then it needs to come down. And so that comes by acknowledging the truth and asking God to reform our minds so that we think like he thinks. Let me also talk to the men specifically, and this just needs to say publicly. Friends, pornography is not okay. It is just not. And also when it comes to like the thinking less than of women, if there's anything that's going on inside of us that objectifies women, it needs to be removed because women are created in the image of God. And if you dishonor women, you actually dishonor the God who created them. And we live in a culture where it seems like pornography is considered normal. It's, the, you know, a guy's struggle. It's just the way it is. And friends, that's an absolute lie. And you need to know that you can be free from that. And so on one hand, I'm going to be understanding and being gracious to recognize, like, the stuff has real significant power. There's no doubt about that. But Jesus had, Christ has more power available to us. And I'm calling all men to not tolerate any of that any longer. And even when it comes to that, like, the issue of lust and what that is, so much of the responsibility that's been on men has actually been placed on women. And say, well, that's your fault. Friends, it is actually not their fault. And women and girls need to be set free from that. To say it's our responsibility. And I would say to the women, like, it's not, no, it's not normal. And it's not the way it's supposed to be. And men can help it. Maybe not in themselves and in the flesh, but by the power of God, they surely can. And it's time to stop making excuses that objectifies women that ultimately leads to a wrong way of thinking about them, leads to abuse and, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And it's time to come free from that. And I want you to know, 
Like if you need to come clean to somebody, what you're gonna find in this congregation is grace and help and partnership and freedom. And we're gonna believe you, with you. We're not gonna manage this problem. We're gonna be free from it, okay? So just so you know, like come on, let's take out, let's go on with tenacity. And then secondly, I wanna to speak to the women because you grew up in the soup as well. And so I wanna ask you, like you search your own heart. Is there anything in you that actually sees yourself as less than? where you don't step into a calling, you don't step into a place because, hey, I'm a woman, so I'm not gonna be accepted or I can't do it as good as a guy. Like, like what are these strongholds in your mind that actually is the framework for which you think and so you hold back and step back? And then sometimes what happens when it comes to women is women oftentimes feel like they need to prove themselves. And they feel like, okay, well, in order for me to make it in a man's world, quote unquote, you have to develop a certain sense of masculine traits to do that. And you don't, you shouldn't have to. Because men can be fully men, women can be fully feminine and fully women and actually step into the calling together that God has for us and we advance the kingdom together. So women, you don't need to prove yourselves. Can I just tell you that? You don't need to prove yourselves. I know that you, and I understand why you think that you can. I'm just simply making the declaration of the environment that we want. You don't need to prove yourselves. I think of even places like uh, uh, Proverbs 31, which is this list of all these things that, and women sometimes get under the burden of of Proverbs 31. Like I gotta do all these things. I gotta buy a field, start a business, make clothes for my family. And all the, the wisdom writer is doing saying, hey, here's some things that a woman of integrity actually does. It's not a to-do list. Ladies, it is not a to-do list. And women need to be set free from having to prove themselves so they can just simply be themselves. Let me invite you to stand. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that uh, your grace enables us. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. We make everything submit to the knowledge of God. Anything that comes against you, anything that, any way in which we think in our mind that's inconsistent, God, with how you revealed yourself to us, it can be torn down. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to over the men in this room, any way in which we've embraced a thought process that there's a stronghold in our mind that thinks that women are less than, God, we just cast it down right now in Jesus' name. We repent, Father, for coming into a place of agreement with that lie that's been spoken to us and maybe even spoken over us. And we repent of that, God, in Jesus' name. And I ask you, God, to complete the work in us that we see women as equal partners in advancing the kingdom and and demonstrating the nature and character of God in Jesus' name. Father, we repent of any way in which women have been objectified even through our own thought process. And the way that maybe we honor certain women, our wives and mothers and whoever, sisters, but then other women are, are objects. And Lord, we would say no, no longer. It is not okay. And Lord, even as our culture has said, actually, it's okay, it's normal, we would stand against that lie, Father, and we ask you to come to, as your grace and mercy comes and your Holy Spirit teaches us and t- touches us, that it, as you would set us free from that, God. So we extend grace for the purpose of finding freedom in Jesus' name. And then, Lord, over the women as well. God, we break off the power, the mindset that simply says they are less than or insufficient. For most of the women in this room, whether that's been spoken over them or whether it's been implied, it's been spoken over them all of their lives. And so, Lord, it's only in the power and authority of Jesus Christ that I can say we break off those words in Jesus' name, that they would be free to be all that you've called them to be, to fulfill the calling and plan and purpose that you have for their lives. I ask you, God, as well, for many women who feel like they need to prove themselves, I pray, Father, we would break that burden off their backs as well. And we would say they don't need to prove themselves. 
They just simply need to be themselves. And I pray, Father, they would be free from that burden of having to prove themselves just simply to be themselves. May this be a place here at Ephrata Community Church where we advance the kingdom of, of God together. We honor one another and your glory is displayed here in its fullness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. He didn't say you shall know my opinion and my opinion will set you free, but you should know the truth and the truth will set you free. Uh, through Kevin, the Lord's given us a powerful message of truth today for men, for women. And I want to encourage us to, to walk in that. Even before the service today, someone was given a picture of Jesus washing people's feet. And, and the word with that was that Jesus wants us to be free. He wants us to be clean. He wants us to be cleansed. He wants us to be whole. And, and again, as Kevin said, we just invite you, if we can resource you or help you in any way in that, uh, in being free and knowing him, uh, we're here to resource you. Also, Psalms 86 verse 11 says this, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Isn't that a great declaration? Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. That's our prayer for you this week, to walk in that freedom. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The series that we've started, um, Let the Peace of Christ Rule in Your Hearts. If you're here today and or watching online and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we just want to encourage you. Would you just take that step? Man, peace begins with having a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you'd like more information, you can even text the two words, know him to 97,000. We'll get some resources in your hand. We'll follow up with you. We'll connect with you. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. But peace begins with peace with God, a right relationship with him. And as Kevin reminded us, then all other relationships flow out of that relationship as well. And as you leave here today, your connect cards, your prayers, your ties, your offerings, they can be le uh, left in those uh, containers as you're leaving um, the exits. But I want to also, as we bring this service to a close, invite our prayer teams here to the front. They're here to pray with you, to stand with you in prayer today um, about anything, uh, either there's something that the Spirit has spoken to you in your heart during this service, and you just like somebody to stand with you in prayer about that and seal that to make that declaration or maybe there's something on your heart this morning that you're carrying on behalf of somebody or yourself, we just invite you um, to come and to receive prayer uh, for that. There were a couple of uh, words of knowledge that were given ahead of today's service, and I just want to speak them out. And if this touches you, I want to encourage you to take a step of faith and receive prayer for healing um, in these particular um, areas. One is uh, pain in the right jaw. So I don't know if it's tooth-related um, or surgery surgery related, but to, um, uh, pain in the right jaw. There was another one of a picture of black um, spots on the left lung that God wanted to bring healing um, to that left lung. Um, also, uh, low blood sugars uh, tied to diabetes that the Lord just wants to heal today. The Lord wants to bring healing to diabetes today. Um, and a right hip bone, um, a good bit of pain um, in the right hip. Um, so those are just a couple of words, and there's a few others. Okay, and one specific one, someone's been diagnosed this week with cancer, and uh, God wants to bring healing in Jesus' name. You can come front to this side. Uh, we'll get somebody over here that brought that word to pray for you specifically um, in regards to that. Um, yes, yeah, so Lord, we just say yes and amen to these words. And the freedom that you're bringing through the truth of your word that was declared today and the freedom that you're bringing through just words of knowledge that are touching hearts right now. And God, that you want to supernaturally do a work. God, you supernaturally want to bring healing and hope and freedom in the name of Jesus. And so, God, we just release the name of Jesus upon your people today, upon everyone watching online and everyone in the room, that we take the name of Jesus with us and we carry the wonderful message of the good news of Jesus that sets us free and the news that can set others free around us. Lord, help us this week to live with an undivided heart. God, we bless you. In your name we pray. Again, we're available here to pray with you after the service, and I'm dismissing you with this blessing over you. 
that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord would make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord would turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you.